Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn please to the book of Job. Job, or as I said when I first got saved, Job. I didn't know better, but I sure did love Jesus. And uh, called Psalms Palms. I preached for six months thinking the Concordance was part of the Bible. I never could get a good message out of that book. <laughs> Fell asleep every time I tried to read it. But uh, whether you call it Job or Job, it's in the Old Testament, right before the book of Psalms, chapter 14. Job 14, verse 14, and not even the entire verse, just the first part of the verse in the form of a question. Job 14, verse 14. If a man die, shall he live again? And as I preach tonight, I want you to allow that question to just mull over in your mind all evening for the next few minutes. If a man die, shall he live again? And while you're thinking of that question, now I want you to turn in your Bibles to the first blank page. That's what the preacher says when he doesn't know what to preach. Go to the blank page. But everybody has one in the front or back of their Bible. And do what I've done. If you have something to write with, write on the top of that page, my ten most wanted. My ten most wanted. The FBI has their ten most wanted. I think Christians ought to have their ten most wanted. Amen? And write a list of people that you know that need Christ. I've written a list. Every Bible I have. I've got 13 or 14 different Bibles I use for different study methods. And this particular list, is like every list I have. My dad's at the top of every list. I'm praying God to say, my dad. How many have somebody in your family that needs Christ? Raise your hand. Somebody in your family. I saw entire families come to Christ last week in North Carolina. How many of you like to see that happen this week? Say amen. How many entire families getting saved? The next one is my stepfather. Then my big brother. Look there, number eight. Phil Donahue. <laughs> How many believe that's a good idea? Say amen. <laughs> that's right. Only Jesus could save his liberal soul. <laughs> Look at number 10, Madonna. <laughs> Instead of criticizing her, I decided to start praying for her. Amen. Instead of blaspheming Jesus, maybe she'll start worshiping Jesus. Man, I, listen, I believe God answers prayer, don't you? Make a list. You know how many people are going to win people to Jesus this week? People will just make a list. Just start asking God to give you names of people you're going to go after. As I have some Christian t-shirts back there, I got one back there that says, Join Simon Peter's Offshore Shops for all the fishermen. On the back of it, it says, You catch them, he'll clean them. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> we don't have to clean them up. All we have to do is tell them. The Holy Spirit will sell them. God says, Go tell. And that's what I'm praying this week, that we'll go tell. Why? If a man die... Shall he live again? The answer to that is an emphatic yes. A man told his 16-year-old boy some time ago in northwest Chicago, true story was in the Chicago Tribune newspaper, told his 16-year-old son to go downstairs and fill up the Coleman lantern with liquid. They were going on a camping trip that weekend, and his 16-year-old son went downstairs and filled up the Coleman lantern with the fluid. He either accidentally slipped or fell as he walked back upstairs with that Coleman lantern in his hand. Because when he slipped, the Coleman lantern swung from his hand, hit the water heater, and when it did so, it broke the lantern. The fluid splashed all over the boy's body, covered him from head to toe. And when that happened, the pilot light on the bottom of the water heater sniffed out the fumes of that fluid and literally ignited that 16-year-old boy into a human torch. And as most people do when that happens, you should not, but he just ran as fast as he could upstairs, making it much worse. He ran outside the back, outside the back of the house and out to the front yard just screaming and yelling. A man in the neighborhood saw and heard and chased him down and flung him down on the ground and doused the flames and saved his life. Not until, though, he had received third-degree burns over much of his body. It was in the dusk of the evening in northwest Chicago. A lot of children were playing, and they saw this horrible tragedy. And I'm told that the school system brought in counselors to deal with those precious children that had seen this horrible sight. And they were able to help them and console them and help them get over what they saw. 
But one of their parents tells me that what they were having trouble dealing with was not just what the children saw, but what the children heard. Because when that boy ran out of that house, he was screaming and yelling and wailing in such a way those children had never heard such screaming in their life. And they were getting in the middle of the night, getting up with nightmares, screaming like that boy. And they couldn't get over what they heard. And when I heard that story, you know what I thought? I thought to myself, what kind of preacher would I be if I really believed there was a real hell where people really go when they die without Jesus Christ? Better question yet tonight, what kind of Christians would we be if we really believed there was a real hell where men and women and teenagers go when they die without Jesus Christ? You know, I want to get something very, very clear tonight before I really give you the message. Every time Jesus Christ preached to lost, unchurched, pagan unbelievers in the world, you read it in the Bible, Jesus preached on love and mercy and forgiveness. But when Jesus was preaching to the religious crowd, many times he would preach on hell and eternal damnation. You know why? Because he knew that church people needed to be awakened to the reality of hell. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask you tonight, not just to make a list. Some of you made it, and like always, some of you didn't. But whether you make a list or not, would you ask God to break your heart over somebody that needs Jesus? I really don't know how we can walk out of here tonight without a burden for the lost if we'll really ask God to help us see hell the way it really is. And I wonder, I wonder tonight, if you would allow me to tell you what Jesus said about hell. I ask that because in a lot of circles I travel, to be quite honest, it's not cool anymore to preach on hell. If you're going to be accepted in some crowds, you're just not going to preach on hell. I mean, in some parts of the neo evangelifish world, may I use that term, they just really don't appreciate you talking about hell. Well, they would not have appreciated Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ preached more on hell than he did on heaven. One Bible scholar recently said that there's 240 chapters in the New Testament and 230 of the 240 substantiate there is a place called hell. Jesus preached on hell 10 times more than he preached on heaven. Jesus Christ preach on a place where people go when they die without Christ, where they will be on fire and they'll never burn up. You remember what he said in Luke 16? Again in Luke chapter 12. And also, you also know that when Jesus was on earth, he didn't use English. He spoke in Greek. And you know that. But when he preached on hell, and listen, 24 times in the New Testament, the word hell is found. But 22 of those 24 times, Jesus is speaking. And Jesus spoke often on the subject. But when he spoke on hell, and when he used the word hell, he used two different terms. The first word that he used, you say, Randy, does that mean there's two different places? Yes. Does that mean there's kind of a purgatory? No. Jesus, first of all, spoke of a word. He used the word Hades. And when Jesus used that word, that meant the place of hell where people go immediately when they die without Christ. The place of Hades is where people go without Christ when they die, and there the suffering is all the same. And it is the place of hell. But then there is another place of hell which Jesus called Gehenna. He spoke of, of it often. One time he spoke of it in Mark chapter 9, verse 43 through 48. And he used the word Gehenna. He said in, the, in Gehenna, in verse 44, it's a place where the worm dieth not, the fire's not quenched. Verse 46, he said it's a place where the worm dieth not, the fire's not quenched. Verse 48, he said it's a place where the worm dieth not, and the fire's not quenched. I think Jesus is trying to sell, tell us something tonight, don't you? I don't know if you saw it, but right on the top of USA Today newspaper, about two or three months ago, it was this summer, the front page, the first section, the very top headline story. Scientists find immeasurable temperatures in the crust of the earth. And the story went on to explain how the scientists have now dug so far into the crust 
of the earth. They haven't gotten to the core. But they say in the crust of the earth, they've gotten so far down now that their measuring devices cannot measure the temperature. It is so hot. It is hotter than anything or any fire on earth. Jesus says the place where the fire is not quenched. But something else. He said it was a place where the worm dieth not. I never have been able to figure that out. Until I read the USA Today newspaper. And they say they have now found something very unbelievable if they hadn't found it themselves. In the midst of this heat, where anything that even comes near it immediately is burned, incinerated. They say they have found 10 foot long worms thriving. Worms over 10 feet long in the crust of the earth, in the midst of this heat, growing. No light, no life, but these worms. Folks, 2,000 years ago, Jesus said it was a place where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. How many believe this book's the word of God? Say amen. Jesus knew what the scientists were going to find out, and Jesus spoke it 2,000 years ago. But when he used the word Gehenna, if you were alive in Jerusalem in 30 AD when he spoke this, you would have known exactly what he meant. Because the word Gehenna is actually a word that they knew of as the city dump or the valley of Hinnom. Gehenna, the same thing. And did you know that they did not just take their trash at the end of the driveway and the garbage man come pick it up? They take their trash to the city dump. Gehenna, the valley of Hinnom. And they would burn it day and night. And so the trash would be on fire and you would smell it, you would see it, and you would hear the fire but that's not all. When he decided to describe hell, he asked his disciples to come here. And he looked at Gehenna, that valley of Hinnom, the city dump, and he said, that's what hell's like. But they didn't just dump their trash. The historians say they used to dump wild, savage beasts alive and throw them into the city dump, and they would burn. But that's not all. I hate to say this publicly, but the pagan, unbelieving, People, unchurched, unsaved people, sometimes would take their mentally retarded or other handicapped babies alive and throw them into the city dump on fire. Amen. And so that any time you walk by, listen, any time you walk by the city and walk by the city dump in the valley of Hinnom, you would not only smell, but you would hear the weeping and the wailing and you would see the fire burning. And Jesus said, that's what hell's like. Robert Murray McChain said, nobody should ever preach on hell without a broken heart. And did you know that 84 people a second on planet Earth die without Christ and go to this place called hell? You know what? It's been since 1879 that the United States of America has seen a national awakening. When Jeremiah Lamphere was used of God, a businessman in New York City, to sweep across this country and revival fire through prayer. How many believe we need revival again? You know, I believe one reason we haven't seen revival is because many preachers have quit preaching the entire truth of God's Word. We've lost the fear of God, and we've compromised the message. You want to know why we had great revivals in the years past? Because men like John Bunyan in the 1600s wrote a book called Pilgrim's Progress. How many ever heard of that? Raise your hand. Pilgrim's Progress was written by John Bunyan on the walls of his jail cell. And for 14 years, he was in jail for one crime, preaching without a state license. And John Bunyan was so used of God, they say that wherever he went, the fear of God followed, and wherever he walked, people would just fall on the ground and cry out and ask God to save them. You know why? He preached on hell. Not only did he write Pilgrim's Progress, but his two most popular books in his day were two books, one called Sighs from Hell. The other one was called Groans of a Damned Soul. And it went into 20 different editions worldwide in the 1600s. Why did God use him? He preached the entire Word of God. And he did not compromise the message. Perhaps the one man used of God greater in my life than any other in my early Christian experience in terms of my reading, was a very, very godly scholar of the 1600s from England named Richard Baxter. 
And somebody gave me a book by him when I first got saved. And I was just consumed by what God had shared with him. And I'll never forget reading this. May I quote you one paragraph of one sermon that Richard Baxter preached on hell? Listen carefully. He said, their everlasting flames of hell will not be thought too hot for the rebellious. And when they have there burned through the millions of ages, he will not repent of the evil which has befallen them. Woe to the soul that is thus set up as a butt for the wrath of the Almighty God to shoot at and as a bush that shall not be burned in the flames of his jealousy and never be consumed. And you can't talk about great sermons on hell without mentioning the name of the greatest intellect this country's ever produced, bar none, his name Jonathan Edwards. In 1741, he stood behind the pulpit of his church in Northampton, Massachusetts, and he preached a sermon you may have heard of called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. In that sermon, Jonathan Edwards asked his entire church to imagine they were not in a church, but rather they were in a furnace. And they were sitting on a hot bed of coals. And they would have to sit there forever and they'd never be moved. But something you may not know about that sermon, the second time he preached it to his church, they had to interrupt him four times. The men, the ushers, had to interrupt their pastor four times so the men could calm the people down because so many people were screaming and crying and asking God to save them. The Spirit of God had fallen on that church and God used that message in ministry to sweep across this country in what historians call the first great awakening of the United States. But did you know something? God also used a man in the 1800s in this country by the name of John Henry Newman. And he believed like C.H. Spurgeon did concerning demons, at least one of their teachings. He believed that one of the purposes of demons is to latch on to the human soul at death and drag that soul to hell. And John Henry Newman made this statement. He said at death, the poor soul struggles and wrestles in the grasp of the mighty demon whose every touch is torment and drags him to the eternal abyss. John Charles Riley was the Bishop of Liverpool. Please let me quote one short paragraph of his message on hell. He said, and I quote, let others hold their peace about hell if they will. I dare not do so. I see it plainly in the scriptures. I must speak of it. I fear that thousands are on the broad road that leads to destruction, and I would fain arouse them of the sense of peril that is before them. What would you say of a man who saw his neighbor's house in danger of being burned down and never raised the cry, fire? What would you think of him? And then, of course, the Prince of Preachers, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Listen to me, young people, and I'm praying this tonight and this week. Young men, young ladies, I'm praying that God will raise up many into his service this week from this church. Wouldn't that be wonderful? I'm asking God to cause the hearts of young people to be broken before him, to surrender, to circle this globe and preach Christ all over the earth from this church. How many of you like to see that happen? Say amen. I'm telling you that'd be the greatest, greatest privilege you could ever have in life. Say, so why do you say it? Because listen, say, well, I'm so young. God can't use me. You wait. You're thinking like a chicken. C.H. Spurgeon wasn't a chicken. Listen to this. At age 27, there is no doubt or debate about it. He was the greatest preacher in the world of his day. The Queen of England would want to hear him preach many times, and he would come often to preach to the very Queen of England. He would come oftentimes to open fields, and people would gather without hype, without promotion, without publicity. And they would come because Spurgeon was there, because the power of God was on him. He preached to thousands weekly, and one day at age 27, he went out to an open field in Hackney. Within a few minutes, 10,000 people had gathered to hear Spurgeon preach without a microphone, without any aid. C.H. Spurgeon preached a message entitled, Hell, and Where Will You Go? Please let me quote one short paragraph from it. It is labor in the fire. No ease, no peace, no sleep. Everlasting storm, unceasing tempest, the angel binding you hand and feet, holds you one single moment over the mouth of the chasm. He bids you look down, 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 down. There is no bottom. And you hear coming up from the abyss, Solomon's hollow groans, screams of tortured souls. And on every chain of hell, there are the words, forever lost, forever lost, forever lost, forever lost, forever lost. People, how can we leave here tonight without a burden for the lost? How can we do it? 
I want you to listen very carefully tonight to what Jesus said about hell. God has used these great men in the past, but Jesus wants to speak a word to us tonight. Jesus Christ himself said in Luke 16, 19, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and he fared sumptuously every day. And then he said there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And then it says it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. That's a word for heaven. And the rich man also died and was buried. And it says in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and saith unto him, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember. Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. I want you to see three or four quick things from that passage tonight. Number one, hell is a place of unending life. We have some weird idea, especially around Halloween, about life after death. We think we're going to become some ethereal spirit, some Casper the friendly ghost floating around after we die. Folks, that's not reality. That is a lie from the world. Do you know what's going to happen when you die? You're not going to be some ethereal spirit floating around like cats with a friendly ghost. The Bible says that this man that died and went to hell had a head he could lift. He had eyes he could see. He had ears he could hear. He had the sense of touch he could feel torment. He had a tongue he could be thirsty. He had speech he could talk he could cry. This man was fully cognizant with all five systems fully operating in hell. Listen. You'll remember. You ha he had a mind. He, he could have memories. He remembered. Abraham said, son, remember. Listen, as soon as you leave here tonight, 10 minutes after you leave tonight, some of you will forget every word I've said. But in hell, if you don't come to Christ, listen, if you die without Christ, you go to hell. You'll remember every word of this message. I believe that with all of my heart. You know what? Some of you think, man, I don't need this. This isn't something that really is going to fill the emptiness inside my life. I want every single person to listen to me. Christianity has become so self-oriented that we're coming to God now trying to see what we can get from Him. We're coming to church now trying to see how God can meet our needs. I'm going to tell you something. There is a hell to shun. There is a heaven to gain. And the Bible says it's a place of unending life. How do you know that? Not only from Luke 16, but Isaiah of old said in chapter 33, verse 4, Who among us shall dwell in everlasting burnings? The word everlasting in the original means from vanishing point to vanishing point. You know how long it's going to burn? Forever and ever and ever. The Bible says in the New Testament, in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 8, whose end is to be burned. How would you like to look forward to that tomorrow? The only thing you're going to do tomorrow is burn. And the next day burn. And the next day burn. That's all they have to look forward to in hell. More burning. More burning, burning, and burning, but you'll never burn up. Do you have a mom without Christ, a dad, a son, a daughter, a family member, a next door neighbor, a friend at school, a friend at work? Ask God to break your heart. Ask God to help you see them tonight burning in hell if they don't get saved. Ladies and gentlemen, Revelation 14, 11, Jesus said, The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever and ever, and they have no rest there day nor night. John 3, 36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath life, but he that believeth not on the Son hath not life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Listen very carefully. Hell is a place of unending life. But not only that, it's a place of unusual torment. Four times in this passage, Luke 16, Jesus used the word torment. Four separate occasions. I think Jesus is trying to get a message across, didn't he? The word torment literally means unending agony or severe, severe pain. We've all had our hand burned or cut somewhere in our body, haven't we? But what happened when that happened? After a while it went away, didn't it? The burn was real bad. The cut hurt, but then it healed itself, didn't it? Listen, in hell, 
the burn won't go away. It won't be better in an hour. It won't be okay in the morning because the morning will never come. The morning will never come. Ladies and gentlemen, hell is a place of unusual torment. I will not take the time tonight to quote to you everything Jesus Christ said about the torment of hell, but just allow me time for one book, just one book. Jesus said in the book of Matthew, chapter 5 and verse 12, he shall burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 8, verse 12, there should be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Matthew chapter 13, he, should, he said there should be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 22, 13, he said there should be wailing, we, weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Listen, when Jesus says something in this book, we better listen, amen? But when Jesus, and he doesn't do it very often, but when Jesus Christ repeats himself, word for word, we better not just listen. We better get on our face before God and we better say, Jesus, what are you trying to say to us? Jesus is trying to give us a message. People hear sermons on hell every once in a while, but Jesus Christ preached it everywhere it went. And then what did he say in Matthew 10, 28? He said, Fear not him which can kill the body, and after that has no more he can do. But after he hath killed both body and soul, is able to cast both into hell. David said in his generation, There's no fear of God before their eyes. Paul reiterated it. Paul said in Romans chapter 1, in his generation, there's no fear of God before their eyes. Ken and I travel all over this country and speak in high schools from coast to coast. And I think Ken would agree with me, in this generation, there's no fear of God before their eyes. You better start fearing God. Ladies and gentlemen, hell is a place of unending life, of unusual torment. And I want you to listen to this statement by John Calvin. He's been greatly misunderstood. But he said something that's very interesting. He said he believed that all the metaphors in all the verses on hell in the Bible are simply metaphors, although literal, but they're also metaphors of something far worse. Why? Because human tongue and human pen could not write in human words the torment of hell. There's no way. I am totally failing tonight, and I understand that. I could not, if I was the greatest order in the history of the world, describe to you the torture of hell, but I think that Calvin summarized it best for our human finite minds with this statement. And I believe it will probably be the most important statement I make tonight outside the Word of God. Listen to what he said, and you have to listen carefully to catch it. John Calvin said, The only way to understand the wrath of God in hell is to understand the love of God. Because the love of God is so great, to reject the love of God, you automatically inherit the full wrath of God. Did you get that? Let me repeat it. To understand the wrath of God, you must first fully understand the love of God. For the love of God is so great, to reject that is to inherit the full wrath of God. In other words, as wonderful and awesome and great as the love of God is, that is exactly how awesome and horrible the wrath of God is. I'm telling you, you don't want to inherit the wrath of God. Number three, hell is a place of ungodly associations. Remember what the Bible says in Revelation 20 to 11, let him that is filthy be filthy still. That's who's going to hell. Say, who's going to go to hell with me? Somebody said, and I'm sure you've heard this if you witnessed much. Somebody said to me, Randy, I want to go to hell. I said, why do you want to go to hell? Because all my friends are going to hell. Ever heard that? Well, you may go to hell. And your friends may go to hell, but you're not going to see them in hell. You're not going to party with them in hell. Hollywood has painted a very, very false portrait of hell. They put movie segments in their pictures and say, here's a poker table and a bunch of guys smoking and drinking, girls on each hand and playing poker. That's hell with the devil standing there with a pitchfork. Folks, that's not hell. Jude verse 13 says, Hell is the blackness of darkness forever. You're not going to see your friends. You're not going to get drunk in hell. You're not going to have any sex in hell. You're not going to get high in hell. You know what? One of the worst things about hell is that you're going to want to do all those awful things that you want to do on earth, but in hell, you'll never be able to fulfill them. You're going to have that lust driving you and that desire, to, but you can't ever do it. I'm going to tell you something. If you're smart tonight, here's what you'll do. If you want to get high, you want to get drunk, you'll leave this room tonight, and you go out to some bar in Austin, and you walk into some darkened bar, 
into the arms of some degenerated lover, and you have your fill of sex until morning, sir. You get as drunk as you can, and you find some prostitute, and you get as high as you can, and you do as much as you can here, because in hell, you're not going to sin one time. Amen. You're going to want to do it all, but you'll never be able to do it in hell. You better do it now while you can. Amen. So I want to go to hell, because my friends are going to hell. Folks, they may go, but you'll never see them in hell. The Bible says in Revelation 21, 21, 8, but the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. This is the second death. Who's going to hell? Revelation 20, verse 14. Whosoever name was not found written in the book of life was cast into hell. That's who's going to hell. Church members who have their name written on the church rolls but not in the Lamb's book of life. Church members all over this auditorium got saved in both services this morning, and I think it's time you get saved too. Ladies and gentlemen, I was in Gaston, Alabama. Brother Ken and I were there just a few weeks ago. And several years ago, I was there in a revival meeting, and the associate pastor's wife was sitting in the audience. She was a singer. She got up on the platform just like many of you singers tonight, and she sang all the time for Jesus. She was a, she was a servant of the Lord. Everybody said she thought she loved God. But I preached one night on a subject of hell. She came forward weeping at age 21, and she was just trembling. I mean, the conviction of God. She said, I'm lost. I'm lost, and I need to be saved. And that church member came to Christ. I was in San Diego, California, and Brother Ron Abel, the principal of Heritage Christian School out there in San Diego, huge school system, came to me on Sunday morning before I was getting ready to preach. And I'd been preaching in school all week. And that Christian school principal just knelt down in the front row, put his arms around me, just weeping. And the pastor's introducing me. He just, he said, Randy, I need to get saved. I need to get saved. I said, man, you're the Christian school principal. You're saved. You're on staff at the church. You're saved. He said, no, I need to get saved. And I'm not going to put it up anymore. And we went back in the pastor's office and he got saved. I'm telling you, the greatest thing that could happen tonight would be for a lot of you just to get saved. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Last of all, number four, hell is a place that is unusually barricaded. It's unusually barricaded. You've heard the Puritans talk about the road to hell is paved with good intention. You've heard of the walls of hell, the halls of hell, the gates of hell, the keys to hell. But I've got good news for you tonight. Right in front of the gate of hell stands the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. God doesn't want anybody in here to go to hell. I got something else for you you may not know. God didn't make hell for you. God made hell for the devil and his demons. Say, how could God send anybody to hell if he's loving? Hey, God never has and God never will send anybody to hell. We send ourselves to hell when we reject Jesus Christ. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2, 3, and 4, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God and men, that he will have all men to be saved. 2 Peter 3, 9, Peter said that the Lord is long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. John 3, 17, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through, the, but through him, Jesus, the world might be saved. God isn't a God that wants to send you to hell. God is a God that wants to send you to heaven. He went to great lengths to do it. He sent his own son to die for you. I beg of you, don't go to hell. I beg of you, don't let your friends and family go to hell. May this week at this church in Austin, Texas, Christ Memorial Baptist Church, may this week be the greatest week of harvest we've ever known. Ladies and gentlemen, it can be. If we'll ask God to break our heart over this place called hell, I'll never forget reading Watchman Nee's great book on the ministry called Ministry of the Word. I understand he wrote most of it in prison, that great Chinese saint. And you know what I said? He said that I'll never forget. He said if you preach all three or four points of your message, you get everything down, you still haven't been a faithful preacher if you haven't released your burden. And I'll be very honest. I've cut some of this message out. And I haven't really done as well as maybe some professional critic would say I should. But I do want to do one thing tonight before I walk off this platform. I want to release my burden. Would you allow me to do that? I hold here in my hand a book called Preventing You Suicide. I wrote it through my tears, as some of you know. Because you see, it's dedicated to my little brother Andy. This is a picture of my little brother Andy. I was speaking in San Diego, speaking in schools and churches like this. 
And my little brother was living up in San Jose. And my little brother Andy asked me to come see him. He called me up. He said, Randy, why don't you come see me? I said, Andy, I'd love to come see you, but I'm really busy. Folks, if you don't hear anything else tonight, hear this. When you get too busy for people, you're too busy. That's why I respect this church and this pastor and you people. Because in the midst of a building program, you're understanding that Jesus didn't die for buildings, he died for people. And the only reason you're building it, building is because people need to be saved. You don't want them to go to this place called hell. There's no reason in the world why this money can't be raised just like that. And it will be if we see there's a real hell. You see, this isn't a building for building's sake. This is a building to get people in, to hear the gospel so they can be saved. Amen. Amen. And ladies and gentlemen, I've seen more than one church die on the vine when they got their eyes on buildings. You keep your eyes on people. You keep loving people. Because my little brother called me and said, Randy, I really need to see you. And I said, Andy, I'm really busy. I'd love to fly up and see you this weekend, but I'm busy. I said, yeah, Randy, you're doing good stuff, though. Listen, the devil will let you do good stuff if he can keep you from doing the best. He'll let you build a building if you get your eyes off people. He'll let you do a lot of stuff if you forget about people for whom Jesus died because the devil wants them in hell. And I'll never forget the last words I ever heard my little brother say to me. He said, Randy, it's only a $39 plane trip. I said, I'll try to make it. And I hung up the phone. I didn't make it. I got too busy. Three weeks later, I was at Southern Illinois University speaking in drug abuse. And my big brother, Rick, called me. Five in the morning in a hotel room. He said, Randy, our little brother Andy, had just taken an overdose of drugs and killed himself. He is dead. Have you talked to him lately? I said, yeah. Three weeks ago. But I got too busy. I used to let kids cut up. I used to let people sleep and not pay attention when I preach. I didn't care. I don't cut any slack with anybody anymore. You know why? Because I thought my little brother was playing some games, just fooling around. But you know what I found out? The San Francisco police told me he was doing $200 of nose candy every day. $200 of cocaine up his nose every day. And he ran out of coke. You know how I felt? Some of you know how I felt. I know how I felt. And he knew I knew. That's why he thought I could help him. That's why he called me. But I got too busy. And three weeks later, he ran out of cocaine, and his dealer was out of town, and he couldn't find any more dope. You know how I felt? His mind was going crazy. His body was falling apart. He was climbing the walls. He would have killed his mother for a little dime bag. But he couldn't find any. And so he did the only thing 18 teenagers could do today. Before you go to bed tonight, 18 more kids will be dead because of suicide, because they don't have any more reason to live. They finally got a reason to die. People, wake up. Wake up! That world out there is dying. They're not the enemy. They're victims of the enemy, and they need our love. Don't come here tonight and soak it up. Get out of here and tell them that Jesus loves them. I beg of you, don't let anything come before Jesus this week and what God wants to do here through your life and your friends and family. Say, so Randy, why? Because my little brother got out a pink sheet of paper and a blue ink pen and he wrote these words. To whom it may concern, I'm sorry for what I'm doing, but I just don't want to be hurt anymore. And I don't think anybody loves me. Love Andy. And he reached over and he picked up 40 hits of amitriptyline, 15 hits of Elevil, and he laid down and died. And there's not a thing in the world I can do about him tonight. He's dead. We flew him back to Indianapolis. We had his funeral. We put him in the family crypt, in the side of a wall, in a marble block. There were so many flowers there. I stood up in the middle of the funeral my pastor, Dr. Dixon, was speaking. And I said, why didn't we give him any flowers when he was still alive? That's why Ken and I have come this week, to spread some flowers while you're still alive, to get you to spread some flowers while your friends and family are still alive. Don't wait to the funeral. Don't wait till it's too late. After it was over, everybody would walk by, and my mother 
was weeping as you can imagine she had lost her youngest son and she was just so weak from weeping so long and so hard and she asked me to help her to come to the casket and I led her up to the casket to look at her son and my brother and I couldn't look because I know if I looked I'd cry and if I cried they thought I'd weak I was weak and I didn't want to cry I was just so messed up in my head my mother was weeping and she looked at my little brother she leaned down and kissed his forehead and I'll never forget she patted him on the cheek and she said precious Andy goodbye she turned to me and I was turning away and she grabbed my neck she grabbed my shirt my tie and she said look at me Randy I've watched you for two days you haven't looked at your little brother you won't look in the casket look at your little brother Randy and tell him goodbye I said mom please I can I don't want to mom please and she took her hands and she grabbed my cheeks my face and she literally put my head into the casket she said look at your little brother and tell him goodbye and I said goodbye Andy and then I broke and I began to weep my knees buckled and I lost my strength the men had to come hold me up they came and helped my mother up we were both crying and screaming so loud they had to separate us it wasn't very pretty some of the men took my mother out that side some of the men took me out that side and just before we both got to the doors she yelled across that marble mausoleum and she yelled at me and she said Randy Randy so what do you want mom she said Randy don't let anybody else go to hell don't let anybody else go to hell right now I want everyone here to imagine for the next five minutes and I'll be done for the next five minutes I want you to imagine that this auditorium is not an auditorium anymore for the next five minutes I want you to imagine that this pulpit is not a pulpit but rather it's just a control booth in a huge elevator this is not an auditorium it's an elevator ladies and gentlemen we know the Bible teaches nobody can go to hell and come back. But Billy Sunday, the evangelist, said, if my workers could just go to hell for five seconds, I'd never have to motivate them again to win souls. Would you right now ask God to catch the burden I'm trying to release? With everyone in here sitting still and not moving, I'm going to ask the men, don't allow anyone to move. If you're sitting near children, please, adults, if you're sitting near children, Please comfort them. Make sure you're near them. I usually ask the children to leave, but I believe there's enough supervision to control them. This is going to be very intense for the next three or four minutes. This is not an auditorium. This is an elevator. And we are going for the next three or four minutes to the place called hell with every single person paying attention. I don't want anyone leaving or disturbing in any way. I want everyone here to come with me and ask God to give you just a glimpse, listen, just a glimpse of hell, because if you do, none of us, none of us, from the pastor to this evangelist, right on to every single one of us, none of us will ever be the same, ever. Are you ready? I'm pressing the button right here. It's marked hell. I just pressed it. We're now beginning to descend. We're going down, down. We're leaving the earth now. We're going down. We're beginning to enter the crust of the earth. As soon as we leave the earth, we lose our sight. At least we don't see anything. It's completely black. We don't see anything. We lose the sight of the beautiful, beautiful earth. We don't see the sun, the moon, the stars. We don't see the children playing. We don't see the grass, the trees, the lakes. We don't see anything. You put your hand to your face. You can't even see your hand. It's the blackness of darkness forever. We're going down, down, down. Now you lose your hearing. At least you don't hear anything. You lose the sounds of earth. You don't hear the children laughing, the people talking, the horns honking, the birds singing, the planes flying. You don't hear anything. Down, down, down. We get down further. All of a sudden, as we get closer to hell, we begin to hear something again. We hear again, but now 
We hear something that is so horrifying. Ladies are putting their hands to the ears. It's souls, millions and millions of souls. They are weeping, they are wailing, millions of them, grinding their teeth, gnashing their teeth, millions at a time, like a million fingernails, scratching a million feet, blackboards with their fingernails. It's so excruciating you can't stand it. But we're going down, 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 and we stop. Right on the precipice of the lake, we look out the windows and to our horrifying amazement, the Bible was true. It wasn't just Randy, the evangelist, trying to hype the crowd, trying to excite the masses. No, the Bible is true. It's a real lake. There's no water there. It's a lake of fire. There are men, there are women, there are teenagers, there are people, there are real people on fire, really burning. It's real. Please, women, children, stay in. Men, 18 years of age and older, come with me. As we begin to walk out, we just want to talk to somebody just for a moment. We walk around the charred walls of the damned. We cannot believe the suffering, the pain, the punishment, the tortures more than human words can describe. But we must talk to someone. Is this really as bad as it looks? All of a sudden, we see an old incinerated rock, smoke coming from that rock, like it's been on fire a million years, something, a shadow moving behind it. All of a sudden, we get the nerve. Please, excuse us. Is someone there behind the rock? We're from Austin. We're from Christ Memorial Baptist Church. We're in revival. And we'd like to talk to us. Excuse me, could you come out and talk to us a minute? And all of a sudden, he comes out from behind the walk. A little decrepit creature. He, he, he looks so horrible. This creature, his face, his, he, there's worms eating in and out of his face. There's, there's fire and smoke coming out of his ears and his eyes. He, he looks so horrible. We, we can't describe it. We turn in horror. We can't even look. All of a sudden, we get the nerve to look to him and ask him, Excuse me, you look so horrible. I'm sorry, but you're in such pain. You, you, you look so evil. Are, are you the devil? Are we talking to the devil? Who are you, a demon? No! I was a man. I walked on earth. Like you are a man and walk on earth. I was a man. I'm a man. But you look so horrible, so evil. What have you done to deserve such pain, such punishment? Were you a murderer, a gangster, a tyrant, Adolf Hitler? Who were you? Who is Hitler? Who are you talking about? What do you mean? I was a man like you. But, but didn't you ever hear that you didn't have to come to this place while you were on earth? Didn't you ever hear about a man who could save you from this place? Didn't you ever hear about Jesus? You shut up! Don't you say that name here! No! Don't say it! What do you mean? Did I hear about him? I walked with him. I knew him! I worked for him. I knew him. Oh, I heard him every day. I fooled them all too. Yeah, he trusted me with the money. John, he didn't know. I fooled him. And then Matthew, Philip, Peter, I fooled them all, but not him. Oh, those eyes every time he looked at me. Every time he looked at me, he looked through me. I knew that he knew what I was from the beginning. And one day, because of greed for money, for 30 stinking dollars, I sold him out. I realized what I had done. I hung myself. Look at me. $30. That's why I'm here. Yeah, I knew him. I was a member of the first church. I was a treasurer in the church. Yeah, I knew him. What do you mean? Sometimes those silver pieces, they turn themselves into ravening ghosts and they haunt me and laugh. Sometimes they turn themselves into cackling demon and they mock. They dance around the wall of fire that surrounds me day and night. And they look down and they mock me and they laugh at me. Your idols will one day mock you. Sometimes they turn themselves into ravening wolves and they chase me all over the lake of fire and they chomp at me and bite at me and I remember what I did I remember I rejected him I turned from him I denied him I sold him out I sold him out and here they come here they come the wolves are coming and Judas runs back behind his rock for more suffering and pain and torture torment and punishment a church member one that walked with him talked with him and worked with him 
the inner circle, but didn't know him personally. Men, if you'll come with me, we'll get back in the elevator, and we can go back and have church as usual. Hurry up. You had to stay, didn't you? You had to look around, didn't you? You just heard him, didn't you? Your friend at work, he just saw you. He just yelled for you, hey. Hey! Hey, buddy, come here! Hey, Tom! Hey, Bob! Hey, John! Hey, Robert! Hey, what are you doing down here? Hey! Hey, Lee! Give me some water! Come on! Get me out of here! Come on. Get in the elevator. You can't help him now. This is an illustration. It's a story. It's not real. It's not happening. Will you please get in? You had to look. You saw your son, your daughter, your husband, your wife, your friend, your neighbor, your mom, your dad. You just saw them. They're yelling at you. Help us! Hey! Why didn't you tell us? I'm not trying to put you on a guilt trip. I'm trying to tell you this thing is real. If you'd get back inside, I'd appreciate it. I wish you would have. I'm in Austin tonight, Andy. It's just a story, Andy. Randy! Andy, this is another revival. We're not really in hell. I don't really see you. You don't really see me. This is not real. This is an illustration for the people so they can catch a glimpse of hell. Do you understand? It's not real. It's real with me, Randy! I've been burning for ten years! Why'd you get too busy? Why did you have time to come see me? Randy, could you just give me some water? And it's an illustration. It's not real. I, I, I am in a church. I'm on a platform in America, in Austin, Texas, on earth. Randy, help me! Andy, it's too late. Randy, don't let her dad come down here. Don't let her dad come down here. Don't let her big brother Rick come down here. I won't, Andy. I'll keep praying. Randy, don't quit praying. Keep praying. Keep loving. Keep witnessing. Don't let him come. You can't just give me a little drop of water. No. Not a drop. Randy, what, Andy? What do you want? Randy, tell the people that church where you are in Austin. Tell them it's real. Tell them it's not just an illustration. Please tell them. Your little brother's burning. Tell them. Tell them if they're not right with God, they can't write. Tell them to quit being phonies. Tell them to quit playing games. Tell them to get one foot out of the world and both feet in Christ. Tell them to sell out. Don't tell them to read their Bible and pray and bring tracts and witness and share Jesus. Please, Randy, don't let them come down here. Randy, give it all you got this week. I know you're tired. Please, give it all you got. Andy, I promise. I'll give Christ everything this week. I'll serve the church. I'll love the pastor. I'll give him the truth. I promise, Andy. Randy, don't quit. Don't give up. Keep going. Keep telling. Don't let anybody else come to hell. Andy, I promise. We've got to go. It's getting late. I'm sorry. I know. Sorry doesn't get it. Men, will you get in the elevator? Get, just get back. Everybody get back. Women... 
teenagers, you don't want to know. Children, don't ask. You don't want to know. Close the doors, men. We're back. <sighs> Push the button. We begin to ascend. As we ascend, we hear them yelling at us. Hey! Hey, don't leave us down here! Hey, what are you doing? Hey, when you get back there, tell them it's real! Hey, come on! Somebody said, Randy, have you been called to preach? Do you have a call from heaven? Yeah, I've got a call from heaven, but I've also got a call from hell tonight. I mean, you believe heaven's real, but so is hell. You listen tonight. As we begin to ascend up, we begin to lose the sights and the sounds of hell. We move up higher, up higher, up higher. We get to earth. But we don't stop here. We keep going up. Past the first heaven where the birds sing and the clouds are formed to the second heaven where the Milky Way galaxy is, where the stars are. We go to the third heaven, to the heaven of heavens. And all of a sudden, for just a moment, we walk in the streets of gold. We know hell's real. Is heaven real? And all of a sudden, we realize just as real as hell is, so is heaven. How many of you know somebody that's in heaven waiting on you? Raise your hand. You know somebody there? They see you too. I beg of you, don't go to hell. Go to heaven. I beg of you, don't let anybody else go to hell. Lead them to heaven. Show them heaven. Show them Jesus. Mm -hmm.